Mark chapter 15, verse 33 through 39. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, le me sabachthini, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled the sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus, uttering a loud cry, and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. The word of the Lord. When I was a kid, uh, we grew up in a house full of books. And one of them was a book called Alastair Cook's America. It was a, a history of America, but it had a lot of illustrations and photographs in it. And I used to love looking at the pictures in that book, but one of them horrified me. It was a picture of a lynching from August 7, 1930, in Marion, Indiana. I'm sure many of you have seen this photograph. It's probably the most infamous lynching photo of all time. I'm not going to show it to you because it's so violent and disturbing. In fact, if you try to look at it online, uh, you have to give permission first. It'll always show you something like this. It'll say, this image may contain explicit content. Safe search blurring is on. It, this image is so violent and disturbing that part of me honoring you is giving you the right to decide whether or not you would want to look at it. It's too horrific, too shocking, too disturbing. Are you feeling the weight of this? That is just a taste of how horrifying, shocking, and disturbing crucifixion was. Like lynching, crucifixion was not just a way of eliminating a human existence. It was purposefully designed as a way of erasing a human person. It was a way of saying, this is not a person, this is a bug. It's a worm. This does not belong to human community. Now, when it comes to lynching, many people would say, but we should look at it. We should confront the horror and the darkness. Otherwise, we sweep it under the rug which is just making the injustice even worse. I agree with that. So here's what I will show you. In the picture, there's a man looking straight at the camera, and he's pointing to the bodies hanging behind him as if to say, look at this. Now, in his white southern mind, it's probably a warning for him. He's saying, look at what happens to lawbreakers. But there is a deep irony here. Because for the rest of us, this is a call to look at the injustice, to look at the horror, look at the dehumanization, look at the darkness of human evil. Friends, we should look at injustice. Even more, we should look at the cross. What does it mean? What happens if we look, and I mean really look, at the cross? We're in the middle of a series in which we're looking at different questions Jesus asked. Up until now, all the questions Jesus has been asking are questions he asks of human beings. Today, however, the question is a question Jesus asks of God. He asks, why have you forsaken me? Jesus asks this question of God, but to look at this question is to look at the cross and to look at the cross is to look straight at things we don't want to look at, but we desperately need to. Today, let's look. And if we do, this shows us three things. Looking at this question, looking at the cross, shows us darkness, forsakenness, and faith. Let's take a look at each one of those things this morning. First, when we look at the cross, we see darkness. In verse 33, the passage begins by saying, and when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now, Jesus was crucified at what was called the third hour, which is 9 a.m. 
So the sixth hour is noon, or, and um, that means that there was darkness from noon to 3 p.m. But this isn't just any darkness. This is a supernatural darkness. In the Bible, darkness is a sign of spiritual and moral darkness. For instance, in John chapter 3, Jesus says, the light has come into the world. And by the way, earlier Jesus says explicitly that he is the light. He is God who has come into the world. He says, the light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Jesus explicitly connects darkness with evil, but that's not all. Um, Where does this darkness come from? What is the source of evil? Notice Jesus says that people loved the darkness rather than the light. Now, Jesus just told us explicitly that he is the light. He is darkness, which means that darkness or evil is simply the result of loving something more than we love God. That is a very different way of thinking about evil, is it not? When we talk about evil, we usually use it as a category, uh, and we only use that for the very worst people, like Hitler or serial killers, because that's evil, not us, not me. The Bible has a much deeper and far more nuanced understanding of evil. When we talk about evil, we think that evil is doing bad things, and as long as I'm not doing bad things, then I'm not evil. But This is showing us that evil, doing bad things, is simply the result of something much deeper, a broken relationship with God. So, for instance, all the way back in Genesis, when God creates the first human beings and he puts them in a garden, he he puts them there and he says, you can eat from any tree in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. That command about the tree was not just an arbitrary rule as if God is saying, obey me or die. No. It's an invitation to trust. God is basically saying, will you trust me to determine what's good for you? Will you trust me to, um, for all the love and happiness that you need? The command about the tree is not just an arbitrary rule. It's an invitation to trust. And trust, by definition, is a relational category. Trust is only possible in relationship between human persons. So here's what this means. Um, Evil is not just doing bad things. It's seeking really good things apart from God. It's not just doing bad things. It's seeking good things apart from God. I mean, think about it. Uh, What was the first sin? Was it murder or theft or adultery? No, it was seeking good things apart from God. So in Genesis 3, 6, notice... Uh, When the woman saw that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was good for food, that means nourishment, and that it was a delight to the eyes, that's talking about beauty, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, that's talking about wisdom, then she took and ate. By the way, she also gave some to her husband who was standing right there, not doing a darn thing, and he took and ate it too. Now, can we just ask a stupid question? Are nourishment and beauty and wisdom, are those good things? Of course they are. The problem is not good things. The problem is seeking really good things, seeking the love and happiness we need in our own strength and power instead of trusting God for the goodness, love, and happiness that we need. Do you realize what this means? Evil is not just doing bad things Evil is seeking really good things apart from God. It's not just breaking the rules. It's breaking our relationship with God. So, for instance, in our modern world, when we say everyone should be free to live however they want, as long as they don't harm someone else, what we're saying is, hey, I'm the one who determines what's good for me. I'm the one who determines what's right and wrong for me. No one else, including God. Can we just ask the question, another question, if you're here this morning, especially if you're exploring faith, I want to invite you to consider, how's that working out for us? How's our world doing? You know, there's a a whole group of academics, scientists, historians, and others who are known as the new optimists. Have you ever heard of the new optimists? 
Uh, Steven Pinker, the best-selling author, is probably the most famous of this group. But they're called the New Optimists because they are incredibly optimistic about human power to make this world the place it ought to be. And their main idea is that, hey, look, the world is getting better and better. And by many standards, that's actually true. In terms of wealth, health care, education, safety, equality, Every single one of us would rather be alive today than 500 years ago, or even 100 years ago. And yet, we also live in a world with dramatically increasing rates of anxiety, depression, loneliness, addiction, and suicide. We live in a world where people are more and more concerned about our climate, about the future of our planet. People are more and more concerned about the, um, the division and the hostility and the bloodshed that just never seems to be ending in our world. Yes, we live in a world that is full of good, but we also live in a really dark world. Don't you ever feel that? Would it be possible? I mean, is it possible to, that, that living in a world that says you are responsible to create your own love and happiness, you are responsible to create your own meaning and purpose, to create your own identity, you are responsible for seeking all good things in your own strength and power, is it possible that living in, in a world like this puts a weight and a burden on our shoulders that we can't possibly carry because we were never meant to? And that the more we try to carry this weight on our shoulders, the more it crushes us, the more it twists us and distorts us, the more it fills our lives with darkness and turns us into shadows and ghosts of what we were created to be. For instance, the Lord of the Rings is all about the one ring of power created by the dark lord Sauron. And whoever wields the ring wields the power of the ring. The problem is nobody can wield the power of the ring without being twisted into a shadow and a wraith. And at one point, the little hobbit Frodo asks Gandalf the wizard, hey Gandalf, why don't you take the ring? You're a great wizard. Surely you have the strength to handle it. And what does Gandalf say? This is from the book, not the movie. Gandalf says, do not tempt me. For I do not wish to become like the Dark Lord. The way of the ring to my heart is by the desire to do good. But I dare not take it, not even to keep it safe. The wish to wield it would be too great for my strength. Gandalf is saying, I would want to take this power to seek good things. But if I did, it would twist me. It would distort me. It would turn me into a shadow. It would fill me with darkness. Friends, the darkness of evil is not just doing bad things. It's seeking really good things. It's seeking goodness and love and happiness, but in our own strength and power, instead of trusting God for those things. We all think that I can wield the ring, but we can't. And if we do try to do that, it fills our lives with darkness. And that leads to the second thing the cross shows us. We've just seen darkness. But secondly, when we look at the cross, we see forsakenness. You know, the darkness at the cross is not just a sign of our spiritual and moral darkness. It's also a sign of God's judgment on our spiritual and moral darkness. You know, the first time darkness shows up in the Bible is in the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, God creates the heavens and the earth. And then in Genesis 1, verse 2, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. The earth was without form and void. In other words, there was no integration. There was no order and form. It was disintegration. It was dark. It was chaos. But then God brings light, and all of a sudden, instead of disintegration, there's integration. Instead of chaos... There's order and form. In other words, creation is the process of moving from disintegration and darkness to integration and light. Here's what this means for us. If we center our lives on God, then we experience creation. We experience integration and light in our lives. But if we center our lives on something other than God, do you realize what happens? It's the reversal of creation. We experience decreation. 
If creation is the process of moving from disintegration and darkness to integration and light, then decreation is the process of moving from integration and light to disintegration and darkness. So, for instance, in the story of the Exodus, um, Israel was in slavery in Egypt. And God calls Pharaoh to let the Israelites go, but Pharaoh refuses. Instead of centering his life on God, Pharaoh centered his life on wealth and power and having domination over other people. So what does God do? He judges Pharaoh. But what form does that judgment take? Beginning with the Nile River, it's a series of natural plagues on the land of Egypt. God begins a a series in which he methodically starts decreating the land of Egypt from the river and the water to the plants to the livestock to the weather and finally to the ninth plague, which was darkness. And so in Exodus 10 verse 21, God tells Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt, no ordinary darkness. Fast forward to the cross, and what does it say? There was darkness over the whole land. Not only is is this darkness here a sign of our spiritual and moral darkness, it's also a sign of God's judgment on our spiritual and moral darkness. If we center our lives on anything other than God, the inevitable result is the disintegrating darkness of decreation. So that's what Jesus is experiencing on the cross here. Not only is our spiritual and moral darkness coming down on Jesus, but God's decreating darkness, God's judgment on our darkness is coming down on Jesus. What would that feel like for him? How would Jesus experience that? He tells us, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is one of the most mind-blowing statements in the whole Bible. Remember, Jesus is both God and human. But if Jesus is God, how can God forsake himself? What does that even mean? One of the most chilling examples of what this might be like is a video of something called the Still Face Experiment. I share this every few years because it's just so haunting. It's a study of the attachment that babies have with their mothers. And in the video, it shows a baby with her mother. And man, even though the baby can't speak, you could just see they have their own language. They have all these rituals. They have all these verbal and nonverbal cues. Um, they, They have all these different ways of communicating. It is really amazing to watch. But then the mother turns away. And then when she turns back to face her baby, her face goes blank, no expression. And at first, the baby's trying to engage her, but the mother just looks at her with no expression on her face, blank face. And so the baby is trying to get mom to engage. She starts going through the rituals, like, hey, come on, you know how this works. But the mother just stares at her, blank face. The baby goes from confused to agitated to alarmed, and finally to outright panic and terror. She starts crying uncontrollably, and her tears, even though she can't speak, are a way of saying, why have you forsaken me? It's horrible to watch. Now, just to put your hearts at ease, the mother re-engages the baby, and everything's okay. But friends, don't you realize there is nothing more terrifying than being shut out, cut off, and forsaken like that? It's painful enough when a stranger does it to you, but the more someone's love matters to you, there there is nothing more horrifying than being forsaken like that. Friends, on the cross, don't you realize Jesus got a lot more than a blank face from the Father? He was utterly and horribly forsaken. Why? Because we have forsaken God. This whole week, as I was meditating on this passage, on this question, it it occurred to me that, you know, this is a question that Jesus asks of God the Father. But if you think about it, you realize that really, this is a question that God should be asking of us. Why have you forsaken me? On the cross, to be forsaken is to have your personhood erased. 
It's to be dehumanized and, and to have your personhood erased. The more we center our lives on something other than God, not only does that erase the personhood of God in our lives, it erases our own personhood. And the inevitable result is that we slip further and further into the disintegrating, dehumanizing darkness of decreation. But on the cross, Jesus was dehumanized. Jesus, his personhood was erased. I mean, that's what crucifixion does. You know, there were a lot of ways in the ancient world Jesus could have been executed. One way was he could have been stoned to death. Another way was he could have been beheaded with a sword. But crucifixion was specifically designed to erase someone's personhood, to erase them from human community. When we forsake God and center our lives on something other than God, and listen, we all do this. When we do that, we are not only erasing God's personhood from our lives, we are erasing our own personhood, decreation. And the ultimate judgment on that is for God to say, hey, if that's what you really want, thy will be done. But on the cross, Jesus was forsaken on our behalf so that we could be welcomed back into the gaze, back into the arms, back into the love of the Father, so that instead of being disintegrated and dehumanized, we could be reintegrated, rehumanized, and recreated in God. How does that happen? That leads to the last thing we see here. The cross shows us darkness. The cross also shows us forsakenness, but the cross also shows us faith. Um, how does the crucifixion of Jesus uh, rehumanize and recreate us. Notice it goes on to say that uh, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now the temple in Jerusalem was the place of God's presence. The temple was the place where you meet God, where you worship God, where you connect with God. But the reason the temple could be the place of God's presence was because it was also the place of sacrifice. The temple was the place where the broken relationship with God was reconciled. The problem, of course, is you know, that the blood of a lamb or an ox or a goat can never really restore our relationship with God. Not really. So why set up that whole system in the first place? It's because it was a promise or a preview of something that one day God would do for real. In the temple, there was a curtain. It was a massive curtain. It was really more like a wall. It was so thick. And, and that curtain separated the Holy of Holies, which is where God's presence was, from the rest of the temple. And the only person who could go through the curtain into the presence of God was the high priest, a really holy man. And even he could only go into the presence of God once a year, and only if he bought, brought a blood sacrifice in order to make atonement for the sins of the people so that their relationship with God could be restored. When Jesus died, it says the curtain of the temple was torn in two. That is a shockingly powerful way of saying the ultimate sacrifice has now been offered. The ultimate atonement has now been made. Not just the blood of, of an, a lamb or an ox or a goat, but the blood of the only Son of God. And now anyone, anyone can come into the presence of God and be rehumanized and recreated. And we see that with this centurion. Notice it says, when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way Jesus breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Now this it's the climax of the whole gospel of Mark. This centurion is the first human being in the whole gospel to actually recognize Jesus as the son of God. But who is he? Not a holy man. <laughs> no way. He's not even a religious Jewish person. He's a brutal man. That's what centurions were. They were basically hired assassins. His whole job was to put people to death in the most dehumanizing way possible. He dehumanized others, which dehumanized himself. But here, 
he comes into the presence of God and, and, and he sees Jesus dying on the cross and he becomes the first person to actually recognize something that nobody else in the gospel up until this point has been able to see, that Jesus truly is the Son of God. And now anyone, anyone can come into the presence of God. How does that happen? If you're exploring faith, it, it has to happen for you the same way that it happened for the historian, and, I mean the centurion. And here's what I mean. Um, you know, there are different ways of responding to the cross, and we see them in this passage. One way is to ignore it. We didn't read it because the passage is really long, but earlier, you know, there were other soldiers that were there at the cross. And, and even though Jesus was just a few feet away, dying, literally to make a way for them to get to God, what were they doing? Gambling for his clothes. They were completely oblivious to what was happening there. In the same way, we distract ourselves from really looking at the pain and darkness of our lives and the ways that God is healing us through Jesus. We numb ourselves with food, sex, alcohol, drugs, TV, social media, shopping, video games, pornography, working out, working too much, uh, even devoting ourselves to a really good social cause. Anything rather than face the pain and the darkness of our lives and the salvation of Jesus. But other people there, how did they respond to Jesus? They mocked the cross. That one of the other ways of responding to the cross is minimize it, rationalize it. Let's make it small. Let's make it explainable. It's a way of fitting it, shrinking it down so that it can fit into my view of reality. And then I don't have to lose control over my life. It's a way of saying, I don't need forgiveness. There's, there's no darkness. There's no evil in my life. I don't need God's bleeding mercy. This doesn't apply to me. But what about the centurion? How does he respond to the cross? It says that he stood facing Jesus. He stood facing Jesus. And when he stands there, he's like the centurion is the only one there who actually stands and faces the darkness, faces the cross, faces the death of Jesus. And when he does, it says that, that when he saw that in this way Jesus breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. In other words, there was something so powerful and so beautiful about this horribly dehumanizing death of Jesus that went straight to the heart of this brutal dehumanized and dehumanizing man and started rehumanizing him. Friends, if the cross could do something like that for someone like him, what could it do for you? Again, if you're exploring faith, I want to ask you, how are you responding to the cross this morning? Are you somebody who maybe is tempted to ignore the cross, not even pay attention to it? Or do you, um, do you mock it? Uh, minimize it, shrink it down, make it something that you can rationalize for yourself? Or, like the centurion, would you be willing to face it, to allow yourself to come face to face with the darkness, the death, the horror of the cross, and how it's calling you to face your own darkness and receive the rehumanizing, recreating work of Jesus on the cross for you? And by the way, if you're a Christian, this applies to us just as much because it's so easy for us to, um, to minimize and, and to distract ourselves just like anybody else. But the cross always calls us to go deeper. It's really easy for Christians to think, hey, I'm forgiven. I don't need transformation. I, I don't need to, to go any deeper into my own heart. I don't need to ask the Holy Spirit to help me plumb the depths of the darkness in my own heart. But that is a profound distortion of the gospel. Listen, the gospel welcomes you exactly as you are. Okay, we saw that with the centurion. He's a brutal man. He's a hired assassin. The gospel welcomes everybody exactly where you are, but the gospel never leaves you where you are. It always calls you to transformation. If the cross isn't transforming your life, it's worth asking if you've ever really let the cross in in the first place. The cross is an invitation to transformation. It's an invitation to being rehumanized and recreated by Jesus. And that means, lastly, if you are a Christian, that the cross is also a way of inviting others to have spiritual conversations. It's a way of asking other people, hey, why do you think Jesus died? 
What does the crucifixion mean? Now, we may not start there in our conversations with people, but throughout this series, we've been seeing that that Jesus' questions actually teach us a lot about how to have spiritual conversations with people. They teach us how to be welcoming, how to be charitable and elemosinary and, and, and welcoming to other people, inviting people into conversation. So specifically, some of the things we've seen are that Jesus' questions teach us how to, uh, to be curious about other people's desires. What are you seeking? Jesus' questions teach us to be welcoming to those we might be tempted to ignore or reject. Do you see this woman? Jesus' questions also uh, teach us how to invite other people to share with us, hey, who do you think Jesus is? What do you say about him? And once that conversation has been started, Jesus' questions, this question this morning teaches us to ask people, why do you think Jesus died on the cross? What does crucifixion mean? Friend, that question is an invitation to stand and face the cross. And by the way, all of these questions and more are, are questions that um, Alpha, the Alpha class, is specifically do- designed to give people a space to answer. That's one of the things that we're going to be, uh, Lord willing, hosting later in the fall, is, is this Alpha class, which is a chance for people who are exploring faith, who are spiritually curious or skeptical, to come and ask questions about Jesus, to ask the biggest questions of life about our desires and about, um, and about what's going on in this world and about who is Jesus and why did he die. So I want to encourage you, maybe you have friends in your life that you're like, I don't know how to have spiritual conversations with people. Not only do these questions help us engage those questions, but Alpha is actually a great place to bring your friends and and engage them in those kinds of conversations. But friends, this question, especially why did Jesus die, is an invitation to stand and face the cross. It's an invitation to be rehumanized and recreated. It's an invitation to face the darkness in our own lives, to face the ways that we forsake God, but also an invitation to see Jesus forsaken for us so that instead of being disintegrated and dehumanized, we could be reintegrated, rehumanized, and recreated by faith, not in ourselves, but in Jesus and in what he's done for us on the cross. Are you experiencing that today? Do you want to? Stand and face him on the cross. Would you pray with me? Abba, we praise you this morning for your love, for your gaze that is always turned toward us because of Jesus. We thank you for inviting us deeper and deeper into your love, deeper and deeper back into your presence, into your um, renewing work, back deeper and deeper into the rehumanizing recreating work of Jesus on the cross. I pray this morning that you would help all of us to let the cross take us deeper. We're never done facing the darkness in our hearts, facing the darkness in our lives, and yet, thankfully, Lord, we're never done receiving the transformation that the cross offers us. And I pray that you would help all of us this morning to enter more deeply into the cross, into the darkness, and into the forsakenness, that we might enter more deeply into the faith that rehumanizes us and recreates us through Jesus. For we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.